this is Mustafa. Mustafa is a child that I met during one of my medical missions in Jordan. I was providing medical care to refugees and it began to rain. I ran into a van for cover and when I looked out, there was Mustafa looking at me. I will never forget the way he looked at me. I still see his eyes. He had a look of fear, confusion, helplessness. He was standing there in the rain, barefoot in the mud, holding a soaked piece of bread to eat. Mustafa is one of the many children that I meet during these medical missions. He's what the outside world calls a refugee crisis. We are all aware about the refugee crisis, and I'm not here today to share um, any more, uh, lecture you or to ply you with any more information. I am here today to share with you the story of Mustafa and the countless children like Mustafa who live in refugee camps across Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. Their innocent faces have changed me and changed my direction in life. They drew me into a completely different type of life, a better life, but one I never imagined I'd be in. I'm a stronger woman today. I have a stronger voice. I demand change. I want to have a voice pe for people to listen. And I spend most of my free time in refugee camps helping people who have lost so much. But I wasn't always like this. See, the story of these children isn't about what we could do for them or what we can bring them. It's about what they can do for us and what they can make of us if we let them. To understand how these children changed me, let me share a little bit about my background. My parents are originally from Palestine, but I was born and raised here in the United States. I come from a very conservative family. My family grew up in a very small town. They wanted to raise my brothers and my sisters and I in the same traditional ways they were raised. I didn't want that. I said no to that traditional life. I had dreams, I wanted more. So I fought for myself. I got two jobs, paid for my college tuition on my own. I graduated with two different degrees. I worked really hard, I never took any breaks. And now I'm in a, in a major leader role in the United States. I oversee 21 buildings. And thank you. I oversee 21 clinical buildings and clinical operations, and I'm pursuing my doctorate in nursing practice and leadership. So I had a great life. I had great money, great job. I had everything I wanted. And I was that strong, independent woman that I've always wanted to be. But my life in Washington and the way I viewed that part of my life changed three years ago when I got an opportunity to sponsor a boy named Wasim um, from Gaza. Wasim was born with a congenitally deformity to his lower legs, so he couldn't walk. He lived in a tent with his family in Gaza, in a refugee camp. He came to Shriners Hospital um, and stayed there for about six months for treatment. When he first arrived, I remember Wasim's facial expression. He had that sad, lost look about him. I wanted to do everything possible to make Wasim happy. I brought him everything a seven-year-old boy could want. But Wasim would just look at these toys in a very confused way, put them down and not even play with them. At first, I didn't understand why. But then I understood what Wasim needed from me was love, compassion, and to help him believe in himself, that he could do whatever he wanted to do, and tomorrow he has a better future. I gave Wasim what he needed from me. And he felt strong, he felt confident, he felt like he can do anything he wanted to do, like go to school. Today, Wasim is in school for the first time in his life in Gaza. Within six months, he was up walking with prosthetics. He learned the English language. He learned some Spanish too. <laughs> he 
he felt unstoppable, like he can do anything at all. Seeing that positive change with Wasim, it made me want to share this experience. So that's what I did. I shared it on my social media. Friends, family, people I never knew reached out to me and told me how inspired they were because of Wasim. They fell in love with his courage and his story. They saw a little boy fighting for his, fighting to be like any other child. They were rooting for him. They wanted, they were patiently wa waiting for him to take those first steps. People would share my post, reach out to me and tell me how inspired they were because of him. And they wanted to do more. I wanted to help more children like Wasim who, who live in refugee camps and need the help. So I decided to start urging care clinics in refugee camps. I used social media as my pl platform to recruit medical professionals. Um, at first, I only thought I would get local volunteers. But to my surprise, I got people, people who reached out to me from all over the world. Here I can only name a couple people that joined me on these missions. From Spain, Dr. Frioli and Dr. Caliante. From Italy, Dr. Mario. From Egypt, Dr. Mihisham, Mezrek, and uh, ARN originally from Ethiopia. But it wasn't only medical professionals who reached out. It was people f that were photographers, journalists, students, housewives, office personnel, the next generation of, of leaders. We all had the same need. We wanted to make a change. We wanted to make a difference in someone's life. In our first mission, we started urgent care clinics in multiple different uh, urgent, uh, refugee camps. We provided medical care and distributed aid. Some of the aid we distributed was school, school supplies, books, food baskets, clothes, shoes, medicine, basic human necessities. And in some of these pictures you'll see we were providing care. Um, in one of the pictures there was Dr. Faiza, an ER trauma doctor, who was attempting to remove a foreign object from a little girl, a uh, little girl's ear. And another picture, you have noticed that there was um, a woman complaining of high, uh, uh, confusion and lightheadedness. lightheadedness. We checked her blood sugar. But it isn't easy to start these medical missions. They take months and months to plan. I have to find the right area. I have to have enough people on the ground. I have to get clearance to enter the area. I have to find the right environment and the right ty different types of tools to use. P all the volunteers that join these missions have to cross numerous and dangerous borders. At times we're held and detained for hours and sometimes we're denied entry. I personally was held for over 17 hours in a jail-like setting in Lubnan and denied entry. People place their lives and their safety at risk to help people we do not know. All volunteers leave their sheltered home and travel thousands of miles to help people that, who are in need. We pay for our own expenses, we bring our own equipment, and we provide care all day for a week in multiple different areas. We do this not because we must, but because the people inspire us to. In those camps, we are one with the people. The people inspire us to continue to perceive. But that wasn't my difficult, most difficult uh, um, issue to get into. The hardest part was because I was a woman, a lot of people didn't take me seriously. No NGO or no other organization um, would wanted, wanted to work with me initially. They thought I didn't know what I was talking about and what I was doing. Um, so I had to prove to them that I had the experience and the knowledge. And all I wanted to do was to help people, to bring my knowledge from the experience and bring it here. So I fought. And I kept pushing and pushing until they heard me. And I proved to them that all I want to do is help people. And what I'm, my idea is going to work. And it's going to help 
people in a lot of different ways, even if it's something small. In all the refugee camps and impoverished areas that I have been into, the first thing that I notice is the children's faces. They all have that same expression on their face, that lost, hopeless look of, like there's no hope for tomorrow. But then something changes. When they see us, they feel like we care about them. They feel like we're there to help them. Their face starts to change. We become their heroes. Then their face turns into laughter. Over the past three years, this was changed inside of me. When I close my eyes and try to sleep, images of these children flood my mind. I try to adequately take their pictures to adequately show their expressions on their face because I can't s describe it in words. <coughs> their faces is what pushes me to continue to do this work, to give them some type of a hope that tomorrow will be better for them. And it persuades me that their faces persuade me that there's still hope. When we think about the refugee crisis, we think there's, there's no solution and it's too big to solve. But when we start to see the truth that we are all human pe beings and we all need the same things to survive. We need love, we need compassion, and we need humanity. When we embrace the self-evident truth, when we start seeing these people as deserving of the same love and compassion as all of us, we will look for ways to help and we will find them. Remember the picture, this picture that I showed you in the beginning of Mustafa. This is Mustafa now when he sees me. This, this is what healing humanity looks like to me. Thank you.